Hi, boys and girls. It's Mrs. Bakura. So here is the biography, Lady Liberty, a biography by Doreen Rappaport, illustrated by Matt Tavares. And boys and girls, you know Mrs. Bakura loves Matt Tavares' illustrations. So, Lady Liberty. There she is. Doreen Rappaport. Now, boys and girls, this is the author of the book, so she's telling you why she wrote it. New York City Today. 120 years ago, my grandfather fled his home in Latvia, thousands of miles away. He left his mother and father and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and cousins to come to a country where he knew no one. He came to build a better life. As the ferry nears the Statue of Liberty, I try to imagine his ocean journey, and how he felt when he saw her for the first time. He was on the ship packed with people from many different countries speaking languages he did not understand. For days, the ocean bucked and roared. He slept in steerage with others who had no money, longing for fresh air. Most days, his stomach hurt too much to eat. Then early one morning, shouts of the lady, the lady, awakened him. He raced up to the deck. The ship was pulling into New York, and there was Lady Liberty greeting them all. Arms reached out as if to caress her. People lifted babies so they could see her. Tears ran down my grandfather's face. People around him were crying too. And then a wave of cheering and hugging swept over the ship. I wonder if my grandfather ever thought about how she came to be. Edouard de la Bré, Professor of Law, Glatney, France, 1865. It was a warm summer night. After dinner, we moved to the parlor. The talk turns to our dear friend America. We speak of how the Marquis de Lafayette fought side by side with George Washington. Ever the historian Henri Martin reminds us that the Americans would not have won the final battle at Yorktown without Count de Grasse's navy and Rochambeau's soldiers. Our country died for Ameri I'm sorry, our countrymen died for America's freedom. The American Revolution fired our revolution. Their Declaration of Independence inspired our Declaration of Rights of Man and of the Citizen. I often tell my own students that the American Constitution is a model for the world. Soon America will be 100 years old. I share my dream of a birthday gift. August Bartholdi listens intently when I suggest a monument from our people to theirs to celebrate their 100 years of independence and to honor 100 years of friendships between our two countries. Henri says such a gift is not possible now. Emperor Napoleon III rules France. This dictator would not allow such a gift. I will wait for things to change, I say. I will not give up my dream. August Bartholdi Sculptor, 40 Rue Vervain, Paris, France, 1875. La Brulee's dream has become my dream too. Now after 10 years of dreaming, we can make it come true. Napoleon III rules France no more. I went across the sea to America to share the dream. La Brulee gave me letters of intro introduction. I met many famous people, including the president, Ulysses S. Grant. Everyone was polite and seemed interested, but no one offered to raise money to build her. I am not worried. We will raise the money in France. Everything in America is so big. The mighty Niagara Falls pounds liquid thunder. Tall grasses stretch over a never-ending prairie. Jagged peaks soar in the Rocky Mountains. California's giant redwoods cover the sky. In this new world of colossal natural wonders, I found the perfect place for her. She will rise on an island in New York's harbor, welcoming everyone to America. I have sketched Liberty many times and made clay molds. La Boulet helped me at every stage. She will be massive but elegant, as grand as any one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Liberty will rival the Great Pyramid of Egypt and the Golden Ivory Statue of Zeus at Olympia and the Colossus of Helons in Rhodes. Marie Simon Bartholdi's assistant, 25 Rue de Chazelles, Paris, France, 1876. After months of work, we have finished the right arm and torch. Now we start on the left hand. We go back to Bartholdi's four-foot clay model. The pointers 
Measure her forearms, wrist, fingernails, nails, and tablet. They multiply each part by two to build a model twice as big. Again, they measure and multiply, this time by four. Slowly, carefully, section by section, the workers build a bigger model. Bartholdi moves about like a prowling tiger, reminding everyone to be precise. Again, measure and multiply by four. This third model pleases Bartholdi. The workers divide it into 21 parts. Each part will be enlarged another four times. Now the carpenters begin, day in, day out, buzzing and sawing, wood chips and sawdust litter the floor. Narrow wooden strips are bent and nailed together to form the giant molds. Some wood is carved to make softer lines. While dust clings to the workers as they pour plaster over the wood until the shapes are just right. Bartholdi's waits impatiently for the plaster to harden. New wooden molds have been set onto the platter, or I'm sorry, plaster. Now the coppersmiths begin their work. I will not cast her like ancient statues from bronze cannons taken from enemies, Bartholdi says. She will be of pure copper made by workers in an era of peace. Liberty's copper skin will not rust in the salt air of New York Harbor. Copper is light and easy to work. It bends without cracking. Day in, day out, wrapping and banging, as the copper is pounded onto the molds until the shapes are perfect. Bartholdi stalks about the studio from station to station, hurrying the workers along, oblivious to the noise. Finally, the hollow copper, hollow copper shells are lifted off the wooden molds. Now it is Eiffel's turn. He must make sure Liberty stands tall. Gustave Eiffel, structural engineer. 25 Rue de Chavelle, Paris, Fr France, 1883. Lady Liberty is the talk of Paris. Every day, hundreds of people come to watch her grow. To keep Liberty upright is a challenge as great as any of I have faced in building bridges. Her copper shell weighs more than 179,000 pounds. So I made her a skeleton, a 96 foot high iron tower of beams and ribs upon which to bolt her copper skin. Iron rusts when it touches copper. Some say my brilliance is having the beams pass through the fittings so the iron does not fasten directly to the copper. The fittings also let her copper skin move to expand and contract with the weather. I listen to the people talk as they watch her skin being riveted onto the skeletons. She inspires them, she inspires me. Liberty, reality, and fraternity are in the air. Emma Lazarus. Poet, New York City, November, 1883. A gala auction is being held to raise money for Liberty's pedestal. Famous artists are donating paintings. I was asked to write a poem to be sold along with the poems by Longsfellow and Whitman. It is a great honor to be asked. I can write about anything I want, but I have had trouble writing lately because I feel too sad. In the past few years in Russia, hundreds of Jews have been killed. Thousands have been persecuted, their homes burned, their shops destroyed. They truck hundreds of miles across Europe with only the clothes on their backs, hoping to find ships to take them to America. We Jews are not new to hatred. Almost 200 years ago, my ancestors fled Europe too. America was a land of hope for them. It is still a land of hope. Soon, when people arrive in the new world, they will be welcomed by a caring, powerful woman. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. S send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Charles P. Stone, construction supervisor, Bedloe's Island, March 1884. Sweat and grime cover the workers' bodies. Their muscles bulge from months of digging. They grunt and call out to one another in words foreign to my ears as they hack away with pickaxes at old cisterns and stone walls until the hole is 13 feet deep and 91 feet square. They mix and pour cement and sand and large and small stones to fill the huge hole. They pour more concrete on top, 27,000 tons in all, until the foundation rises 65 feet from the ground. They test each layer to be sure it is hard before they pour again. 
Over and over, 16 hours a day, their rhythms never change, only the weather. Every part of their body aches, but no one complains. There were no jobs in their villages in Italy. When the sun goes down, they eat, then stumble off to sleep in makeshift tents on the island. But I believe they are content, for they are building new lives in this country. Joseph Pulitzer, publisher, New York World, New York City, March 1885. More than 100,000 French people, shopkeepers, artisans, farmers, and children, gave their hard-earned money to build liberty. Americans have been give mo giving money, too. $100,000 is still needed to build her pedestal. Some Americans criticize the French for not giving all the money since it is a gift. I read with disgust newspapers' editorials mocking their generosity. Some people call liberty a national disgrace. Others call her New York's lighthouse. The mayor of New York City does not want her. Congress has refused to give money for her pedestal. I cannot understand why politicians do not understand her power as a symbol of freedom. I say she belongs in New York City. New York is the gateway to the new world, the door of hope for immigrants. I know. I landed here penniless 21 years ago. We have more than 100 millionaires in this city who could write a check for the full amount, but no one has. I shall ask my readers for help. They are not millionaires, but I know they will care, for they will understand her importance. Florence De Forest, Metuchen, New Jersey, June 1885. Mr. Pulitzer's campaign is working. More than 100,000 Americans have given pennies, nickels, dimes, and dollars. When you send money, Mr. Pulitzer prints your name and how much you give in his paper. I am sending my two pet roosters. Mr. Pulitzer can sell them and use the money for the pedestal. I can't wait to see my name in print. People as far away as Texas have sent money. Soldiers, factory workers, miners, bank tellers, actors, doctors, farmers, shopkeepers, even gamblers have given money. The most money came from veterans of the Civil War. They gave $1,500. Two boys sent a dollar that they had saved for circus tickets. Another boy sent 25 pennies. Mr. Pulitzer pokes fun at the rich people who don't give. He calls them croakers and laggards and prints their names in his paper too. Joseph Pulitzer, publisher, New York World, New York City, August 1886. Liberty's skeleton is now anchored to the pedestal, bolted to the huge girders that protrude from the concrete. 89 feet tall, 20 feet thick, and faced with granite, the pedestal is more majestic than I had hoped. I am humbled by my reader's generosity. Many who have so little gave so much to build this noble structure. Liberty arrived in 214 crates. On her trip across the ocean, vicious storms buffeted the ship. Labels fell off crates. Pieces of her copper skin were shaken. Many needed to be reshaped. Slowly, each copper sheet is hoisted up with heavy ropes. The workers sit on the crossbars, fitting her copper skin to the skeleton. When one piece doesn't fit, they haul up another and try it, then another, until they find the right one. The first piece of copper skin is attached in the skeleton, is named Bartholdi. The second piece is christened Pulitzer. Each day she grows more beautiful. I predict that those who once mocked her will soon love her and understand her power and significance. Jose Marti, journalist, poet, New York City, October 28, 1886. Today is Liberty's Day. Up and down the Hudson River, French and American flags stretch from mast to mast, from bow to stern, on hundreds of tugboats and yachts, in scows and steamers and ships of war. Rain is falling, but no one cares. The red, white, and blue of the stars and stripes and the French tricolors fly from buildings and stores and arches. Sidewalks, doorways, windowsills, and roofs bulge with people. Adults stand on wooden boxes and scaffolding. A million Americans have come to welcome her. Grand Marshal Charles Stone, astride a black horse, leads five miles of red, gray, blue, and green, regiment after regiment. Soldiers and sailors, young and old, march in lockstep. Eyes front, chests out, arms swinging, left, right, left, right. Legs strut and splash themselves. The militias dip their colors in tribute at Pulitzer's building and the viewing stand. The Rochambeau Granados raise their glistening swords to their lips. 
President Grover Cleveland salutes the bullet-torn flags of past wars. Bartoldi, Bartoldi, people cry as they see him on the viewing stand. Three girls race out to give him flowers. Children in school uniforms. Heavy-footed policemen with shiny brass buttons. Firemen decked out in red shirts alongside their horse-drawn steam engines cheering, Yeehaw! Navy men with big white hats. Zuhavers with fire red pants. Soldiers wounded in past wars riding carriages with judges and governors. And the marching band, so many all playing at once. Oh, say can you see, arise ye sons of France to glory. I wish I was in the land of cotton. I'm a Yankee doodle dandy, a din of drums and horns and tubas. Finally, General Washington's carriage, drawn by eight dappled gray horses. Yays and hoorays for the Continental Guards. The city is one vast cheer. Liberty, the most important word in the world. I know it all too well. I was deported from my country, Cuba, for fighting to free my people from Spanish rule. Augusti Bartoldi, sculptor, Bedloe's Island, October 28, 1886. Liberty's face is hidden beneath our tricolors. I see easily through to her magnificence. I wend my way through the cloud to climb up to Liberty's crown. Surrounded by her beams and ribs, I mount 354 steps, remembering the hundreds of thousands of people, French and American, who helped realize my dream. If only Louberde were here to see, were alive to see her. I crouch to look through her windows. I wave to the boy below who will signal me at just the right moment. Tugboat whistles and trumpet fanfares clash in the damp air. Cannons fire deafening salutes. Finally quiet. A blessing. One speech, a second speech. I cannot hear anything over the shrieking tugboats. The boy waves his hand. At last, it is time. I loosen the cord, holding the tricolors over Liberty's face. The flag falls. Lady Liberty is visible in all her glory. Cheering and shouting rip the air. Roaring cannons, belching foghorns, drum rolls, trumpeters flourish. Arise, ye sons of France, to glory. Oh, say, can you see? Every part of her shouts freedom. In one hand, she holds a tablet engraved with July 4th, 1776. In her other hand, she holds a torch. These flames do not destroy. Mon American does not conquer with weapons. True liberty triumphs through truth and justice and law. She wears a flowing robe like the ancient goddess Libertas. Her right foot is raised. Liberty walks. Freedom never stands still. A broken shackle and chain near her feet. America broke the links of slavery to fulfill its promise of equality for all. President Cleveland steps forward. The crowd grows quiet. We will not forget that Liberty has made her home here, he says. More cheering and shouting, on and on, a glorious explosion of noise. Like hundred Bastille Day celebrations. I feel perfect happiness. The symbol of unity and friendship between two great republics will last forever. It has taken more than 20 years, but this dream of my life is accomplished. These were quotes from people who have arrived in New York City and seen her. I am not going to read it, boys and girls. And this tells you the Statue of Liberty dimensions. I'm not going to read that, but if you want, you can look it up and find out the information. So I hope you enjoyed the book, boys and girls. Have a great day.